Hello and welcome to this R Companion for Lecture 9. Hopefully this continues the trend of, of getting shorter. We're getting much more com comfortable and confident in using R to solve some of these problems. So I don't have to explain a lot of the old, old stuff. Still have to explain the new stuff and the almost old stuff. So we'll start with the, the data in table 10.2. Um, so data in table 10.2. 10.2 is found on page 526. So here's how I imported the data. Uh, the yield is for the yield from the wheat. Um, there's three wheat varieties that we care about. Um, we planted those three wheat varieties in five different fields. I don't really care about the fields. I don't care about the, the levels in the fields. I don't care about the effect of the fields, other than the fact that I understand that different fields are going to produce different yields, which means these, this field is going to be a random effect. So I need to take, or I should take care of that. So go ahead and pause and load the data. Um, while we're here, I might as well, as always, uh, get to know the data a little bit better. We're going to, again, use the aggregate function, the mean of the yield by variety, and the mean of the yield by blocks, and then the grand mean of the yield. And I do this myself, especially when I'm copying data from elsewhere by hand, just to make sure that I got the data in correctly. So I'm looking at table 2, and all the way in the far right of the table, it gives the means by variety. So I'm going to check that my means equal the book's means, and they do. And then along the bottom, it does means by block, and I'm going to check that my block means are the same as the computer, uh, uh, same as the uh, books, and the same with the grand mean. And it looks like everything's fine. Um, the function we're going to use to model, so let's go ahead and model. Um, Summary statistics. The function we're going to use to model again is AOV. It's a very powerful function. It can do a lot of things. Or really, what's happening here is the mathematics is all very, very simi similar. If any of you have taken an applied regression course, you'll have seen that underneath all of that difficult regression, linear regression, is just matrix algebra. And that's really what's happening here, is matrix algebra. We're just trying to find different ways of giving the information to R so R can do the correct matrix algebra stuff. Um, yield is the dependent variable. Variety is the one of the independent variables. Typing is not my own. Oh, block is the other one. So I'm going to run that. Mm, did I not run the, uh, no, I didn't call it blocks, it's blocks, okay, there we go, and now summary, and ooh, what's missing here, I've got some, I've got the means, I've got the error line missing, w wait, wait, where, where did that, where did it, where did it go, and that, that, that does, oh, that's right, I have no replication, if we look at the yield variety in blocks, do it over here. We see that there's three varieties, five blocks, three times five is 15, and there's 15 data points. And since this is a factorial experiment, I have at least one in every combination. Therefore, I have only one. There's no replication whatsoever which is fine because section 10.2 looks at no replication. Since there's no replication, I can keep this as a times or make it a plus, change this into an additive model. There are no reasons to change it to a plus other than I now have that bottom row being residuals and the ANOVA table looks more familiar. Compare the ANOVA table with the plus with the ANOVA table with the times. The variety colon blocks is actually the residuals. The numbers agree. But R doesn't give F values or P values. It can't give P values because it can't compare it to any 
uh, mean squared errors. So changing it to a plus allows for the actual testing to take place. Now if we uh, turn to section 10, well, I don't know, page 529, the heading entitled Solution Example 10.2 Revisited, we'll, we'll go ahead and look at how to get all of those figures from R. And it's going to start with this defining a variable called AOV table. And it's going to be that summary of mod 1, left bracket, left bracket, 1, right bracket, right bracket. If we go back to when we did this before, I forget which lecture it was, um, we created some sum is how to add. And these are the different parts of the ANOVA table that we could look at. And just to double check that we got the same numbers, uh, okay, go all the way up there, that the book did. Here's the total sum of squares of 261.733, that matches. Sum of squares treatment is 98.433, that matches. Sum of squared block, 148.9, etc. And the rest of this we get from the table if we want. Um, we can create our own analysis of variance table just based on this information, but really there's no use to doing that. The real reason that we would want to do any of this mathematics is to store the information in a variable because we may be needing to like mean squared treatment we may need the mean squared treatment somewhere in the future. Specifically since we're heading towards section 10.2.2 we're going to need it for the relative eff efficiency. So instead of just doing these calculations and printing out the information, whoop de doo we should save them in variables. So MSTRT is going to be my variable for the mean squared treatment, for obvious reasons. Mean squared block, mean squared error. I named my variable in meaningful manners. And now I can use this information to calculate or to compute the relative efficiency. And I'm going to break that up into two parts. The first part is the SS sub CR. And the second part is the SS, I mean S squared sub RB. Now we could do this by hand again, just by looking at the ANOVA table. There's the ANOVA table. So using the ANOVA table and the formula for S squared CR, we've got B minus 1. B is the number of blocks. Boom. Minus 1 times the mean squared blocks. Boom. Plus B, T minus B times T minus 1, which really is just uh, the number of uh, uh, the total degrees of freedom minus the blocks, the degrees of freedom, or the total sample size minus the number of blocks is going to be 10. In other words, it's 8 plus 2, or 15 minus 5, uh, times the mean squared error, which is that 1.8. Then we're going to divide by the sample size minus 1. So the S squared CR, according to this calculation, is 11.92143. Since that matches one in the book, we're happy. And then S 2 R B. Well, that's just the mean squared error. I'm sorry, it's just That's just the mean squared error, 1.8, as I said. Sorry, I've got a frog in my throat. So the relative efficiency is just the ratio of the S squared from the CR design to the S squared from the RB design. And there's the 6.62, which means including this blocking variable we've reduced the number of needed sample uh, sample size, we've reduced the sample size by a factor of 6.6.
which is pretty awesome. Without the blocking, we would have had to have 99 or maybe 100, which is 15 times 6.6. .6. We would have needed 100 data points to get the same power as we've got here just by using that blocking design and 15 data points. Now, if we actually just want to, um, instead of looking at the ANOVA table and typing in the numbers, which it's quite all right if we only do this once, if we want to do this programmatically, that is, show our work in, in some way, then we just use the um, formula that's on page 530. And b-1 is the degrees of freedom in blocks, mean squared block, plus this is b times t-1. It's one way of, of calculating that, times the mean squared error, divided by sample size minus 1, or total degrees of freedom or the sum of these. So that's s squared cr. Just to double check that I did this right, 11.92. That matches 11.92 from just typing the numbers in ourselves. Um, s squared sub rb, that's just the mean squared error, which again is 1.800 which leaves the relative efficiency uh, formula. It's the ratio of the S squared CR to the S squared RB, and that gives us the 6.62. Again, the nice thing about this, as we saw back in the lecture on the three-way analysis of variance, the nice thing about this is I can say, oh my goodness, I made a mistake on the yield. It's not 29.5, it's actually 39.5. My goodness, I'll have to uh, get mad at my graduate assistant. So I changed that, and to get all the way back down here, I just run the whole thing again. I don't have to do it word by word, step by step. I can just rerun the entire script. If that was, if, if that data change really was 39.5, then the relative efficiency is now only 3. Well, it's still good. It, it still makes it valuable to use the blocking, but it's not as a good block. It's not, the blocking is not as efficient as the last example. Since the sample size here is 15 and the relative efficiency is 3, that means we would have needed 3 times 15 or 45 data points to achieve the same power as we achieved here to achieve the same power without blocking as we achieved here. But it really was 29.5, and my graduate assistant doesn't know how to measure wheat yield. And the efficiency really is 6.62. And that's it. So what did we do? We got the data in there, data from chapter 10, section 2. We learn that we can double that if the sample statistics or the summary statistics are given to us, we should do the calculate them ourselves, make sure we got the data in there correctly. We learn that the model was used the same function AOV. We learned why we're doing an adding here instead of a multiplying. And then what we did is we replicated or, or recalculated all the, the the statistics from page 529. And then we saw how to calculate the relative efficiency and what it actually means. Um, we did the calculation of relative efficiency both by reading from the analysis of variance table and pulling the numbers off and by doing it programmatically. So I hope this was helpful. Uh, take care of yourself. Bye.